and uh, welcome once again. My name is Evan Ferrari. I'm the Executive Director of, uh, of Emerge Guelph Sustainability. And again, you're at this event known as Guelph, It's Not Enough, How Successful Communities Fight Climate Change, the first of two parts. And this evening we have uh, Rob Kerr with us, who's going to be looking at what other communities um, around, our, uh, around Ontario are, are doing. Um, I also want to um, uh, introduce my colleague, Rasha Abusida, who's uh, with us tonight. And I'd also like to introduce you to the newest member of the Emerge team, uh, Jaden uh, Lasichuk, um, who is our outreach and marketing specialist. And Jaden, uh, just, just a, a brief intro to Jaden, that she's path, passionate about all things uh, climate related. Um, and uh, she comes, she hails, she hails from the small town of Lenswood, Manitoba, a farming community in the Swan River Valley located in Treaty 4 territory. And it's no surprise that she's also a master's candidate in, uh, in geography, and she's focusing her research specifically on climate justice and the Canadian climate strikes. Um, she also has a BA um, uh, in environmental governance from the U of G. And uh, she comes to us through the support of the Canada Summer Jobs Program. And with that, I'm going to hand the, um, the, 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 uh, the, the, um, the, the podium over to, uh, to Jaden to do the, uh, the land acknowledgement. Jaden? Thanks, Evan. Uh, hi, everyone, and welcome. I um, just want to acknowledge as we gather here, we want to remind everyone that Guelph is situated on treaty lands that are steeped in rich Indigenous histories, cultures, and truths, and that these lands are home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples today. As a community, we have a responsibility for the stewardship of the land in which we live and work, and a responsibility to foster reconciliation and respect for Indigenous peoples who have been stewards and caretakers of these lands for generations. Today, we acknowledge the Mississaugas of the Credit, of the Credit First Nation on the Anishinaabe people who have the territory in which we are meeting today. And we encourage folks to continue educating themselves on issues facing First Nations communities and peoples across Ontario and Canada today, and to learn how you can take action to support and uplift Indigenous peoples from coast to coast to coast. Great. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jaden, for that. Um, uh, before we start, just a, a couple of housekeeping things that I, that I, that I want to share with you. One is something that we try to remember to talk about every time is acronym alert. If Rob or any of the other speakers tonight throw an acronym out at you, please put the question in the chat right away. And for those of you that haven't seen it yet, if you move your cursor towards the bottom of the screen, a whole bar will come up across the bottom, and you'll see um, you'll see a thing that says chat, and you can uh, you can ask your questions in that. And um, uh, Rasha, um, Jaden, and I will be keeping an eye on that once we get to the questions and answer period. That will be at the end of this uh, at the end of Rob's presentation. You'd rather hold them uh, hold them until that time. Um, but just very quickly, I want to run through some of the um, I guess a bit of a uh, a promo for some of the other events that we have coming up. And I'm just going to share my screen for a couple of moments here. Um, and of course, here's the event that we're all here for, to, for this evening. Um, next week, it's uh, literally next Wednesday, so a week tomorrow, um, we'll have uh, Karen Farbridge with us, who's part of this, this same series of, well, if it's not enough, how successful communities fight climate change. And uh, Karen will be looking at global pre best practices, whereas Rob is focusing a, a, a lot closer, a lot closer to, uh, to, to home than, than Karen is. And both of them bring an awful lot of expertise to the table. And then after that, or essentially two weeks from Wednesday or tomorrow, um, uh, we have uh, an event, uh, Ontario, undermining Wells climate goals. Um, if you haven't heard of this yet, what's happening is the province of Ontario is looking at increasing um, CO2 emissions by as much as 400% as a result of increasing the amount of burning of, um, of uh, fossil fuel and specifically uh, natural gas. And um, we're doing that in conjunction with 10 other local groups, 10 other environmental groups. And the, um, uh, uh, the, the registration for that is already open. That's going to be on Wednesday, September 30th with the Ontario Clean Air Alliance and uh, Jack Gibbons, um, who's a, a um, uh, extremely knowledgeable on this piece is, and is one of the people behind the coal phase out that he'll be our, he'll be our keynote speaker that night. And there are two other events in the hopper and I got to tell you that uh, 
Rasha, Jaden, and I are working on at least four more on top of it, but these are the ones that we're, we're allowed to talk to you about, otherwise you'll have to kill me if, if we talk about any of the other events. October 7th, three Wednesdays from tomorrow night, that will be in, uh, environmental racism. This one is going to be really interesting. It's Dr. We'll have Dr. Ingrid Waldron from Dalhousie University, and if you don't know about her book, There's Something in the Water, and if you have uh, Netflix, I was about to say Netscape, that's showing my age. If you have Netflix, um, Google or, or search in Netflix for the documentary, There's Something in the Water. Um, Dr. Waldron's book uh, was actually, um, uh, the, the Canadian actress Ellen Page was caught uh, by that book and, and found it um, uh, really compelling because she's a native Nova Scotian and this is specifically about environmental racism in Nova Scotia. Then on October 22nd, um, clearing the air, we're looking at the health impacts of EVs or the positive health impact impacts of moving to electric um, uh, to electric mobility, and that's more than five weeks away. The interesting other piece of this is that um, we've been working with SESI, the Community Engaged Scholarship Institute at the University of Guelph, um, and uh, they've been doing uh, conducting a, um, uh, an, an electric vehicle survey of people in Guelph. And we purposely try to target people that like EVs and that don't, or that they don't have an opinion on them, to try to get a sense of where people's heads were at with all of that. And let me see, am I able to continue to, there we go. Um, just really briefly, you know, for those of you who've probably seen, many of you have seen this before, that uh, our mandate at Emerge is to fight, to fight climate change. And our, um, our goal is to get wealth to 100% renewable energy uh, by 2050. The, um, uh, in the city of Guelph, there are two specific targets. One is the 100% renewable that we, we, we were able to get the, 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 the corporation of the city of Guelph to, um, uh, to incorporate that, um, that goal. And then citywide, the city has established a net zero carbon. And from our perspective, 2050 is way too late. I don't need to tell anyone on this, on this Zoom call today why that's too late. And frankly, we feel that even net zero carbon is too low of a bar for us to be looking at at the moment. And that what we, uh, what we think is absolutely necessary is, is a citywide goal of 100% renewable um, and much sooner. And on that note, I'm just gonna stop sharing for a moment. Um, and, and I wanna introduce our, um, our uh, our speaker for the night, but before we do, Rasha, are you able to um, uh, to release the poll questions? Yes, you just nod there. Uh, yes. Great. If you can release the poll questions. Oh, yes. Uh, so, um, if you just wouldn't mind, uh, uh, the poll should have um, uh, started. This is a really quick poll, and by no means is it scientific of the broader population. It's more than anything indicative of, um, uh, of, uh, uh, of the people that uh, are coming to our events. Um, so um, it'll be interesting to see where this lands and how are we doing. We're just about there. Is everyone, just about everyone voted? Great. Uh, Rasha, do you want to end the poll then? And you want to share the results. So it, uh, it, uh, it shouldn't be a surprise there that, uh, yes, it looks like 5% or 1. Um, no, uh, we have 11 and not really, we have, uh, we have 9 uh, uh, or 43%. Or so it's not really, uh, um, uh, by no means is it, is it, is it meant as a scientific, a scientific approach to that. Um, and on that note, I just, want to introduce our guest speaker for, for, for the evening. And, and Rob Kerr, his 40 year career focuses, this is quite remarkable what he's focused on over these, these 40 years. Um, uh, uh, the transitioning of our society to a low carbon economy while reducing the impacts of climate change. I, I just find it phenomenal that Rob has, has, has um, dedicated his entire uh, working career on this long before people could even spell climate change. He was out. He was out in the trenches on this. He does this through policy development and um, uh, uh, policy development and implementation of projects 
uh, and programs in the municipal and community space. And to get there, he wears a whole bunch of different hats. This is quite impressive. He's a senior associate with Quest Canada's leading organization in advocating for smart energy communities. He's the managing director of Garforth International Canada and uh, his independent consultancy of Rob, Kerr, Rob J. Kerr and Associates. Um, his work experience has been a balance between both the private and the public sector, having worked with Honeywell, Hydro Quebec, Toronto Hydro Energy Services Inc., the Energy Advantage, and Rob has also held uh, senior positions in ICLEI, local governments for sustainable uh, for sustainability, providing policy and program support to cities around the world, not just here in Canada or in North America. And he's committed to mitigation and adaptation activities related to climate change. There he developed expertise in managing intergovernmental relationships from his advocacy work at the global level um, to ongoing advisory relationships with Canadian federal and provincial governments, as well as the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. He's also worked with the cities of Mississauga and, as many of you know, he also worked for the city of Guelph. We're honored to have him with us this evening. Rob, I turn the, share, the screen sharing over to you and welcome. Thank you, Evan. Thanks for that great introduction. Um, can you see my screen? Just a quick check. Rob, you've got to use that green button at the bottom of your screen. <clears throat> it says share screen. I'm sure none of you- There we go. Well, none of the people on this call tonight, Rob, have ever had any problem with watching people trying to figure out screen sharing. Yeah, how's that? Perfect. Okay, thank you, Evan. Thanks for that introduction. Uh, and thanks for everybody for coming tonight. I see some familiar names. And I regret that we can't be together in person and I'm hoping someday soon, very soon we will be. Um, I'm gonna take uh, the next 45 minutes or so. Um, to go through um, a couple of things uh, as um, Evan introduced me, um, it really reflects the, the last three years of my work. Um, I do want to focus in on what other cities are doing as built, um, especially in our region, province, and even closer. Um, and I do want to focus in on some of the value propositions that other cities are using to drive their um, their want to do energy planning, and of course, pivot to implementation. Um, so before I do, I'd like to talk about that movement of cities. So um, this is a really important, I think, contextual thing to share, uh, is um, we're in Guelph here, obviously, and Guelph is built and continues to be built as one of the first cities to have done a community energy plan. Um, that remains true and always will be. Um, but the movement of cities that have followed Guelph's lead um, way back in 2007 originally and the pre, you know, the, 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 um, they call the movement. Municipalities care. Why are they embracing this? What has driven the movement? Where we are today, and a little bit about the mechanics of community energy planning, and that's when I'll talk about some of the cities that I've been working with um, in the last couple of years. Um, throughout the presentation, I, I do want to always point to that pivot from planning to implementation. Um, planning is easy, implementation is less so. Um, to understate that and talk a little bit about how that is starting to burgeon um, across the movement. Um, and lastly, and this will also be threaded throughout my, my slides here, is uh, the economic driver for doing community energy planning. And I'll expand on that as I go. Um, so what I'd like to do is, even though I, I was built to talk about what other cities are doing close to home here, I'm gonna to fly to 10,000 feet and talk about where this movement started. And it's important, I think, to see the mechanics of how things are working today. Um, in 1992, the Rio Earth Summit, some of you would be familiar with it, at least in name. What happened there was, for the first time, the United Nations, which is an exclusive membership club in the sense that the only official members are country. Um, but a Canadian, Murray Strong, had advocated to the UN successfully to include 
um, civil society as a whole and elements of that, including local governments. And my 10 years working at ICLEI was spent a lot growing that very seed um, of advocating for local governments at the global level. Uh, and when global um, agreements are made, and I'll talk a little bit about those, how that impacts uh, the support for municipal, government, uh, municipal governments. Um, so at Rio, a number of conventions were established uh, on environment and planning and desertification and biodiversity and climate change. So the UNFCCC is what we know, uh, and they're the ones that um, uh, create the framework for what has now been 25, um, uh, with I think one exception, annual climate conferences, usually referred to as COP. Uh, sorry, Conference of the Parties, acronym. Um, Agenda 21 is it not familiar in North America as much as it is in Europe. For those of you who've traveled there, might recognize that. Um, it's really a framework for sustainability. It's quite broad, but it has uh, embedded in it a very strong recognition of local governments as key partners in combating climate and the other conventions that are mentioned. So that's the framework. That's in 1992. Uh, so you didn't have to do the math quickly. You realize that's coming up on 30 years ago. So what's transpired in that in the last 30 years? Um, um, you know, the, the fundamental principle behind that advocacy for local governments is a simple one, is that municipalities, their communities have influence over 50% of GHG emissions in Canada. It's roughly the same across the globe, certainly in the developed world. Um, and since Rio, uh, and two major milestones in the 25 uh, climate conferences that happened, Kyoto was COP3, Paris COP21 were, were um, almost unanimous agreements um, to move forward towards um, climate uh, mitigation. Um, so, when I, did, when I was working at ICLEI, the 10 years I spent there, it was kind of ask ourselves the question often is, what are we doing here? We're advocating for local governments, but the, but the follow the dots are really advocating that this signatories to the agreements in Kyoto and Paris and sub-agreements that happened scattered throughout the whole court uh, copy was for um, national governments to go home and develop programs and policies and other activities that support local governments in meeting their commitments um, as most currently made in Paris. Um, and there's evidence of that quite strongly. There's, this is just a sample. The Global Covenant of Mayors, many, many Canadian cities are signatory to that. And these are basically signed commitments towards climate objectives. 10,000 cities have signed on to that. C40 is uh, really an association of major cities, almost 100 local governments there and endless numbers of regional networks. So thousands and thousands of cities have made commitments towards climate change. These are high level commitments, but they create a framework uh, to begin to hang detail and planning implementation. So I've said, I've covered some of this now. Um, I do wanna add that in Canada, and I, I had a view to this in my time working globally, is that Canada enjoys a reputation, and I think it's well earned. It's actually being very functional um, and prescriptive in its support for um, municipal governments in, a, in, in pursuing their climate goals um, or their GHG reduction goals. Um, and this is this is well known throughout the world. The Danish government is kind of held up as being similar. So it's more beyond just basic promotion. It's very functional. And, and the evidence for that is most of the community energy plans, and that's what that acronym stands for, I'm using it throughout my presentation, um, has been supported by the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, which is an advocacy organization for local governments. Many of you will be familiar with it. Um, they have not only been at it for uh, 20 plus years, providing direct support for planning um, and, and also capital projects across the country to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars, um, but they also act as a very powerful network of information sharing and best practice. Um, and I know uh, Karen might speak about this a little bit more next week, um, but increasing signals coming out of Ottawa in terms of post-COVID recovery is that these programs will be accelerated even further. We're quite hopeful, and this is very good news for local governments who will continue to pursue their 
climate aspirations. Um, now, I'll just we'll fly right down to more local, as I promised. Um, in Canada, and this is a Quest report, um, it's quite a little dated now, actually. So at the time, it was just under 400 community energy plans were completed across the country um, or underway. Uh, a good number of them have happened since that report, so it's at least 400. Um, and it's well over 50% of the Canadian population represented by those um, local governments. In Ontario, we have about 50 CEPs completed um, and, and moving towards implementation in one form or another. And virtually all those cities are over 100,000, and I'll go into that a little bit further, but I'm, I'm drilling it down to try and find cities that are uh, similar to Guelph, at least in population, um, so we can start to think, at least at a high level, some comparison um, for where, where Guelph is at, where, uh, where all cities are at, actually, is what I want to report on um, in terms of their goal. Um, so this is actually, I don't know if you can read this, apologies if it's too small, it's just basically a further illustration of my previous point. Uh, this is straight out of Stats Canada. These are cities in the province that are over 100,000 in population. Some of them are single tier, some are two tier. Um, how many have done community energy plans? Virtually all of them. Two of them are part of regional activities uh, in St. Catharines and Cambridge. So they're not, they don't have specific for the municipality, constituency, municipalities. It's clearly the majority, if not all, made some effort um, to develop community energy plans, drive activities that support goals. Some of those goals are stronger than others. Um, and just to, out of interest, and I just did this at the last minute preparing for tonight, how many had done are committed to climate emergencies? And I was quite surprised with the result. With only two exceptions, everyone has. So we have this, and I, and I wanted to use this as an illustration for my subsequent slides, is that we have this sort of functional planning activity going on where it's really attempting to describe very specific activities that will get towards a goal. I'll illustrate some of those activities. And then in the second column here, we have this urgency. And this is sort of speaking to the whole title of this series, Evan. Um, uh, we have almost a matching number. Um, so what does this tell us? Well, it tells us there's in a community, communities and councils who agree with their communities um, that it is urgent uh, and time is obviously a factor. And in the first column, we have the planning exercise, which is where I play most, mostly in the last several years and in my time at Guelph is how does one actually functionally create a framework to actually achieve? And they can often, often be seen in conflict. I personally always take a very neutral position on this. That of course I agree with the urgency. That's not a question. Um, but I'm also aware of, quite literally aware of, the effort it takes to actually get momentum under the implementation umbrella to get you on the road to addressing that. That, will, that, that tension will continue. Um, and I don't think necessarily it's a bad thing. I think you know, drivers towards achieving goals uh, are always a good thing. Um, I've highlighted two cities here, Brampton and Oakville, and that's where I'm going to give you some detail moving forward. Is um, Those are cities that I have been working with extensively uh, over the last couple of years, amongst many others, but I point them out for a couple of reasons. They are, I think I can say with confidence, the most recent community energy plans. Uh, Oakville uh, had their council uh, supported by their community. There's a couple of months ago, months ago, and Brampton is actually going to their council on behalf of the community. Um, and I'll describe what I mean by that. Um, they're going there on the 23rd. Everything I'm gonna show you is actually publicly shared information that's been available already coming out of those two projects. So I'm gonna use those two to sort of illustrate some of the, using this slide to kind of pivot from something that can cause trouble for some folks. Um, we talk about climate change as the overarching, discussion. it's the, it's, uh, the title of tonight's talk, uh, it's often used as a, a simple description of a very complex thing. I just want to describe briefly what we mean when we pivot from a climate change plan to a community energy plan. 
Um, and it's fairly simple. And this, this graph really shows you in Canada, um, you know, how are, how are emissions created uh, from what sectors or from what categories? And you can see what I've circled there. The vast majority of them are energy related. And it's quite simple. That's the message. There are agricultural activities, and we know that waste and methane related obviously contribute to climate change. They're sometimes included in energy planning because waste does have some opportunity to support uh, energy pollution. Um, this is what we mean when we talk about energy uh, and energy planning as a solution towards climate change. So, I'll just start with a simple, and this is maybe an, uh, more of an observation, but it comes from experience, is that um, addressing climate change and reducing emissions at the community level um, has so many benefits, it actually can create a problem. And the problem being is that the many, many stakeholders that you aspire to bring to the table have sort of different priorities in terms of the importance of those co-benefits. Um, I'll just take a chance here and talk about them as all equal benefits on behalf, you know, to the, to the benefit of community um, and are not really stacked up as priorities. Climate change is real, of course, I'm not here to dispute that, of course, but it is conceptual at the community level to a certain degree. Um, and it also creates a conversation that can sometimes get tricky and I've seen it in every community I've ever worked with, I, I, I've seen it and heard it, which is, um, and I'm paraphrasing, of course, um, you know, why is this something that municipalities have to take on? It's a global issue. We're a local government or we're a community, we're local. Now, there's answers to that question, and every one of you on this call probably would readily have one. Um, but it, but it, in terms of the function and the purview of municipalities, I consider it a fair question, at least one that, that can help clarify why we pursue activities at the local level. And what I want to do today is not set aside the urgency of climate change or describe it as a smaller issue, not at all. Uh, I do want to talk more about what, what are the benefits that happen on the ground when you implement a community energy plan. Um, and, and those are the ones that are more real to the day-to-day -day interest of citizens. Citizens, again, I'll say this over and over, it's not to diminish the urgency of climate change. But this is where I play most of the time. The banner along the bottom says it. CAPs are all about quantifying benefits. So that discussions about the value of those benefits to the community, um, citizens and stakeholders alike, uh, is a very important part of why we do energy planning. And um, they're listed here. I could do seminar on each one of these bullets easily. Um, the one I want to talk about today, uh, more than anything, is economic. Um, those of you who know me, this is sort of um, where I've been spending a lot of my time focusing in on is the economic impact. Again, not to diminish other benefits, uh, but I believe and I've seen increasing evidence that uh, economic health of communities, uh, healthy economies, um, stakeholders' role in those economies, is the big is the big tent issue? It's one that everybody can rally around, um, and I've seen evidence of that over and over. What I also have seen is, um, I think, a potential lack of really good research information that actually bolsters that point that I've just made, and I've uh, and I'll share some of the results of a research project I completed uh, as a senior associate to Quest uh, late last year and early this year around trying to get a cl a clear link between implementing community energy plans and its positive impact on a clean and local economy. Um, related to that is the word competitive that we sometimes avoid, uh, but I will embrace that here tonight because it's very much linked to the economic, local economy, is that municipalities cooperate very well together. And you know, and I've shown you some evidence of, of the movement. In those cities, there's many, many avenues for those cities to collaborate and cooperate together. But through an economic lens, cities do compete with each other. Um, when, when players in the market of any, of any sector are looking to locate uh, businesses and create jobs, um, they, look at, they look at the elements of any potential host and they determine where they're going to move. 
improvement. So obviously you have a, a, a municipality that can and a company and municipalities that had desired to and were unable to. There's definitely a link to, between that notion of competitive. It's why I kind of did that um, 100,000 population and less. It's sort of very rough cut, but look at uh, what other municipalities in the province are competing. I'll just quote a, put that in quotations with Guelph for jobs and attracting jobs. This is really to illustrate my point earlier about the many, many benefits. <laughs> and um, again, it's, it, it's a really profound value proposition of why implementing community energy plans is valuable to a community. So all those top line uh, columns there are obviously of great interest to, to, to communities, to the, to the political leaders in those communities, stakeholders in those communities. Um, however, building a movement towards implementing a plan, which is a multifaceted activity, uh, can, be, can be challenging when you're trying to speak to each one of those co-benefits in a qualitative and compelling way to many, many stakeholders. Um, the lead on all of those, arguably, is, is the economy. So a healthy green economy has spillover benefits to those following three columns. So, I'm kind of repeating myself in a way, but I just wanted to make the case that focusing in on the economy is a Big Ten issue. It is a foundational thread through all the other co-benefits, arguably. Um, and that's what I wanted to really expand on here in my presentation. Um, this is, now I'm pulling some slides from some of the jobs that I referred to. This is from Brampton and I've given them uh, citations and with their logos, at least in the bottom. Um, this is one of the first things that um, I have done in the projects that I've been party to, which is what are the future energy costs? There's a premise that leads one to start doing community energy planning, which is we're mitigating, uh, and again, arguably one of the most inflationary, um, uh, vulnerable. Uh, commodities that, that fuel a local economy. That's the cost of energy. So we do go to great lengths to predict and uh, forecast the um, increase in energy costs. In the future. So we usually do it to bookend it, so we do a lower range. So there's some pretty big numbers here. This is Brampton, and their council is going to see, see and hear this on the 23rd. Um, we go from, you know, about 1.8 today to 7.4, and that's the low range. So that's the most optimistic range, and it actually breaks down in terms of um, which which fuels or energy types are the most inflationary, vulnerable. The more profound one is the, the high end. So the higher range takes us up to 14.6 billion, starting at 1.8. So you know we're in the factor of nine at that point. So the message here is pretty clear. Uh, and the science behind these predictions are pretty clear here. Again, it would be a full seminar for me to explain that. We just don't pick these out of the air. These come from research institutes, the government itself, the utilities themselves are why this information. So there's quite a lot that goes into it. But it's one of the most profound messages that anyone can hear is that um, the do-nothing scenario means that $14.6 billion is going to be um, attached to the local economy when today it's about one point. So trying to imagine the impact of that in a local economy can really start some great conversation, can really draw more people to this, more stakeholders to be able to have a discussion about how we mitigate that. And I want to talk a little bit about it. Um, kudos to Karen Farbridge for giving me this, this uh, graphic. Thank you, Karen. Um, I just want to dive into what we mean by energy planning. So we're in the planning mode now. Some of you are familiar with this. Some of this was laid out maybe in slightly different graphical ways when Guelph was doing its own. Um, but these were the slides that were used to develop the initial engagement work. Um, so there's categories um, that really allow the framing of a plan and the drilling down into the analytical aspects of that plan um, and determining the stakeholders that can come to the table and help move towards implementing activities within the 
Um, so there's some principles here of good energy management or integrated energy management. Energy efficiency, of course, is the first and foremost uh, and cheapest way to reduce energy in a city, energy use in a city, and the resulting emissions. Thermal energy is usually talks about district energy, but there's other aspects to it. Combined heat and power are really low local generation plants that create electricity and heat for use um, locally, as well as waste heat from industry that can be quite valuable um, and shared. Renewable energy is probably the most common one, you know, this visually, um, in terms of solar, uh, geothermal, bi biofuel potential, um, and wind, which we know doesn't necessarily apply here in Wild Ferry uh, economically, but is certainly in, in many communities. Uh, the last two categories are a bit different, but they're certainly important categories. Is one, it's how do you integrate a plan? They're not, it's not a menu. It's not creating a list of activities and then endeavoring to implement those activities. There's a lot of um, integration. It needs to be thought of as a whole. And there's endless examples of that. I'll try and touch on some of them as I move through my deck here. Um, but we have different ways to heat and cool. Um, that can change according to economics, that can change according to demand, that's one example. Um, especially when it comes to building district energy systems. Um, microgrids are possible to create really isolated uh, heat and electricity distribution in neighborhoods. Um, and overall, we're talking about moving generation from centralized areas to more local, bringing generation local. And the last category is a big one, which is urban planning. So how we grow, um, is very important in terms of the energy efficiency. Many of you on the call are very savvy to this topic. Um, smart growth is a term we're familiar with. Um, transportation is really where that has um, uh, the biggest positive uh, implication around urban planning is transportation. Transportation is always competitive um, as, as potentially the biggest chunk of the energy use pie in any community. It's a very difficult one. To and of course, we know emerges at the forefront of that with this electric vehicle program. Come back to some of this again. I just wanted to talk about those frameworks. Sorry, I'm just going to go back. Um, the banner at the bottom of this slide really talks about, quite simply, about something extremely important. Um, and I'll touch on it in different ways. But the creation of what we call institutional frameworks is kind of an academic sounding term. But um, what are the entities that actually create um, uh, the conditions for these activities to move forward. For example, if you have a district energy utility, what is, I mean, it's mind boggling to imagine, but cities are doing it. Developing a brand new utility in a, in a city where they are shareholders typically in 100 year old electricity utility. How, how do you develop that? Um, Community-based organizations that are developing strategic partnerships. Talk about that a little bit further coming forward. Um, and lastly, I want to I'll just do a preview on this, is that municipalities and local governments, by this I'm talking about City Hall, um, are often seen as carrying the burden of making all this happen. They are part of an institutional framework and have important roles to play. But community energy plans are just that, they're community energy plans. Um, and this may be the first place to, and I'll do this repeatedly, um, this is the break the back of another conversation I hear often. Um, in, in most municipalities at some point, which is the taxpayer can't afford to make this transition. That's absolutely true, um, but it's never been the intention. Uh, municipalities sometimes take a very strong and visible lead in doing community energy planning uh, and leave the impression that they're actually going to finance it. Uh, that's not the case. Uh, I'll use that, that banner to, to make that point and return to it again. So, um, this is, uh, and Karen again might touch on this next week under the banner of best practice, um, but the two projects that I'm pulling examples from, Brampton and Oakville, were framed around this two-track approach to community energy planning. Well, on the left side is analytical, which is crunching numbers, looking at your baseline, looking at the future. I showed you some slides from there, setting targets assembling scenarios and the measures that support those scenarios. It's very analytical. Might be simplistic to say, but they essentially mean nothing unless you've engaged um, with the community uh, 
to start looking at not only sourcing input, developing that analysis, providing data, agreeing to um, analytical assumptions, et cetera, et cetera, but also you're beginning to establish the connections you need to build those uh, institutional frameworks that I referenced earlier. In other words, you're engaging the community through very structured ways, addition and to implement, not just plan. Um, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, Quest has uh, been mentioned a few times here. Uh, I'm a senior associate with Quest, and Quest has existed for a long time. Guelph was one of the first municipality, if not the first municipality, to join Quest over 10 years ago. It's now a, a very big growing concern in Canada advocating for smart energy community. They've developed some technical principles and policy principles uh, to help find a common ground for all the parties that come to the table. Now, people that participate with uh, Quest are not just municipalities. Um, they, they are a very broad-based organization. They have private sector interests. We're looking to help uh, provide the products and services to achieve the smart energy community goals. Governments of all levels look, look at the policy frameworks um, that help that implementation um, or that planning and implementation process. Um, so I won't, I could spend a lot of time on these, but I just wanted to point out on the technical side, um, there's really a well understood process of doing integrated energy management, um, which is listed here in order. So efficiency is always at the top. In other words, uh, be as efficient as you can before you start looking at different ways to create energy and deliver energy. Um, managing heat is very important. Um, I think it was the International Energy Agency has recently pointed out as district energy um, and its role in providing um, locally sourced um, low carbon heat to its community is really key to achieving some of the very ambitious goals that are being set up globally as well as uh, um, uh, reducing waste heat really speaks to industry to a large degree um, and I'll give you a quick example when I was in uh, um, Anaheim two or three years ago on a day similar to today 35% if I recall correctly but a third of the energy in their district energy system which serves 90% of the community was coming from industry waste heat from industry that's a win-win, cheap heat for the system and those that benefit from the services of that system and it creates a revenue stream. For them. Um, and renewable energy, of course, is uh, very important. Uh, solar being the most visible, solar PV and thermal. Um, and it's often confused as the symbol of community energy planning. And of course, it's very, very important. These other principles are very important to establish before you actually create um, really good opportunities for renewable. And I'll stop there. The policy principles I, I, I won't list here, I do touch them as I go through them. But for the sake of time, I'm going to move forward. So, this, these next slides here, um, there's a lot of detail. Um, these are publicly available on the Brampton website. Um, and I don't know, Evan uh, or Rasha, uh, whether you share your presenter's text, uh, but I'd be happy to share it if anybody wants to get in touch with me. None of this is secret, this is publicly uh, available information. So what I want to do is sort of give you a peek. Time doesn't allow to drill into each of these. Basic pillars of community energy planning in Brampton. That it's followed these principles um, that has a goal towards implementation um, and has been developed by the community through a task force, established task force. This is not the city hall or, or city staff creating plan. They were obviously at the table. Uh, but it was created by a task force. So first and foremost is retrofitting existing homes. And I'll stop on this uh, for a second to say, um, those, who you, those of you who watch this sort of thing know that our federal government um, has been making some pretty strong signals towards um, its commitment towards honoring the goals of the Paris Agreement um, and have indicated repeatedly that they will be focusing on, on retrofitting existing homes as one of their primary or, or priority objectives. Um, and this has been a long time coming. Um, energy planning has always recognized that existing homes are a big chunk of 
the energy usage pie in any community, but very, very difficult to get at um, in terms of giving efficiencies through retrofit. Um, Ralph was one of the first to attempt to put together um, a, a holistic plan using some mechanisms available to City Hall. Local improvement charges, uh, currently referred to as PACE mechanism, that actually can create a program that is cost neutral to the municipality. Um, it has benefits to um, uh, the home homeowner, of course, and the collective goal of the community. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of activity in community in Brampton among them uh, of municipalities looking to develop home retrofit programs. Um, and I know that our Energy Guelph consultant is on the top of their priority list. Um, then there's new homes and buildings. Uh, this is one that actually is not necessarily fully under the control of a municipality, although they they do deliver um, uh, uh, code or, or adherence to energy codes that come from higher levels of government. Strong signals coming that those codes will be increasingly rigorous uh, as new homes are built. And of course, the market is beginning to demand net zero homes too. And wealth has, uh, has had its really good share of pilots and examples of net zero homes. Um, in, uh, in the end. Uh, water efficiency. He, of course, uh, doesn't speak to energy directly, but has a very strong connection to energy, not just delivering it, but heating it, um, and is typically included in energy, uh, sorry, community energy. Um, so this, this one is, uh, is industry. Um, again, municipalities and local governments um, or stakeholders in the community that are non-industrial don't have direct, direct uh, purview over industry. Um, but encouraging industry to be efficient uh, can happen in many ways, uh, from you know best practice recognition to chambers of commerce, uh, and we in our in, in Guelph, you know this and this is true in most municipalities. Chambers of commerce uh, have industrial members um, and uh, have usually have climate or energy uh, themed um, committees and task forces of their own. Um, the good news is industry is way ahead of many other sectors in terms of efficiency. So, uh, industries are, you know, per unit of measurement, whatever they might be, are, are usually quite efficient. So uh, encouraging and supporting that continuation of energy efficiency is part of the overall goal. Um, district energy is um, referred to repeatedly, as I've done here, uh, in, a, in any energy planning effort. There's no, it's no different here uh, in Brampton, uh, as well as Oakville, uh, similar, similar slides here. There's a lot of language here. This really talks about um, where uh, uh, district energy would make economic sense. Um, today's prices and projected future pricing of status quo energy supply, um, but also talks about how uh, municipalities can go about um, fostering the development of district energy projects um, embedded in the overall larger goal of creating utilities. And utilities can come in many forms. Um, there's a whole other workshop. Um, one of the things that we do uh, is some mapping. So mapping has become, uh, in the energy planning world, um, quite the important tool to communicate um, and represent the analytical process. So this is an example of that. There is actually dozens of slides created project as well as open to really uh, spatially show not just how much energy is used, but where it's being used. Um, so we create energy perform uh, um, energy um, energy districts, um, and we look at the existing and projected energy use. Uh, in the future. So this is Brampton. Anybody who's familiar with Brampton would have a sense of this. It's that these red zones um, are the peripheral of the city is where growth is going to take place. So the opportunity for net zero is much higher there. Um, and so those energy planning districts uh, are, are labeled as red. Um, and then the green is where densification exists um, and where it will continue and obviously create very concentrated demand for thermal services. That's Rob, just an acronym alert there. EPD is 
Energy Planning District, correct? Well, I have to confess, I blanked on it for a moment myself. <laughs> energy, energy Planning Districts. Um, planning districts are well known in the planning world. If there's any plan planners on the call, they would know that. Um, and, and in Brampton, we actually borrowed the existing planning districts and overlaid our uh, energy analysis on those districts. So uh, in the planning world, it is called planning districts for, you know, planning objectives that are the key to the acronym. Okay, and uh, now we talk a little bit about Solar, uh, more, more commonly understood, um, we do point out that there's two kinds of solar, um, not to forget that um, photovoltaic is the well-known one and Gulf has um, significant uh, uptake, but there's also solar thermal. Anybody has a cool heater, we know more about this. Um, the scale and technology about solar PV is uh, um, quite well served by an existing market um, and is also very, very inexpensive way to provide heat to the district energy network once it's up and running. Uh, and then we talk about renewables and solar mm -hmm. um, and uh, recommendations. So at the top of each of these slides, like I say, Brampton's um, council will hear this, uh, we have very specific targets uh, and I'll aggregate those targets uh, in a second. Um, I've mentioned transportation a couple times, and this is, the, I would say, be a little simplistic to say, but this is really, I think, uh, the, the most active frontier in terms of energy planning. As you can imagine, um, trying to get a handle on how traffic moves around in a community, uh, what, what kinds of uh, is taking place, what mode, um, and how long trips are, is a very hard thing to get your hands around. Data is difficult to get. Data quality and availability is improving all the time, mostly because this movement is understanding that transportation is a key part of success in getting towards very aggressive climate and energy goals. Um, so we look at energy in three different categories um, and uh, uh, determine targets for those categories. The first is trip length. And we make recommendations, of, uh, recommendations for reducing those. Um, and I will also make an observation, and I, I think it'd be fair to say about Brampton, is that many municipalities have fairly sophisticated transportation plans or active transportation plans as um, adjuncts, you know, to their existing or traditional transportation. They have very, very aggressive objectives. Also, many municipalities are stuck trying to actually be on track towards those um, and community energy planning has really helped sort of raise uh, raise the bar in terms of potential to uh, implement already um, existing active transportation and related uh, We look at trip length. Um, we look at uh, different modes. In this case, we look at increasing transit and other forms of transportation in, in the active category. Um, and then we look at existing uh, vehicles and their, um, their, their efficiency in a standalone way. And obviously the transition to electricity is very important. Something that Emerge knows extremely well. Um, so the, all of what I've just shown you, very briefly, granted, uh, that analysis you just looked at was over a year in the making long time. Um, it all adds up to this. So the top dotted line is kind of the status quo. Where, where would energy, or sorry, where would uh, emissions go um, if nothing was done uh, or just natural activities place, referred to as the baseline usually. Um, and then the aggregation of the activities over time, implementation of those activities that we, that I just showed you very briefly. Where does it take us? Um, it takes them to beyond their community energy plan goals, which are established at the outset. In their case, very similar to the one Guelph established in 2007. Uh, it's 50% energy uh, usage reduction uh, and um, about 60% um, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the other thing to point out here is that the federal goal tied to its Paris commitments is not achieved by this. That might seem to be sh falling short. Um, but I would point out here, 
a complex point to make, but an important one is that based on those economic numbers I showed you earlier on, where the predicted or projected price of energy goes up, that informs the choice, the decision around picking targets, making those recommendations that I just summarized. That at a macro level, they're all seen as economically viable um, and, and uh, achievable, reasonable. Uh, in terms of the cost to, in return, in some cases, um, to to implementing those. And it's a bit of a message, you know, to the federal government is that um, achieving the goals that you set, very difficult for municipalities to do on their own. So it, it can act as almost an advocacy message for the federal government to provide potentially more support so targets can be actually further accelerated. Uh, and I think that's fair game. You know, the federal government supports municipalities on all fronts through transfer payments. Um, this is not like asking for land. I think it's really talking about different ways for municipalities as a priority. Um, I do want to spend some time here as pivoting towards this notion of institutions that I that I tagged at the beginning um, around what we mean by an engagement. Um, this, as, as I showed you, uh, takes place in parallel to the analytical portion. So the lesson has been learned long, long ago. Um, okay, um, lesson learned long ago that uh, compelling analytical reports don't necessarily change anything. You really need um, you really need the uh, community as a whole uh, to move towards implementation together. And so. Parallel to the analysis, we just put together an engagement. I'm going to go through this quickly because I've just got the I sign from Evan to, to speed up a little. Um, so I'll just do this a bit more in an in a overview narrative. Um, identifying the stakeholders is important. You have to really find out who's out there, um, not only as a potential implementer um, of, of a plan, so your local utility, for example, part of it. Um, but who are the large constituencies? Uh, people who already have um, members and participants that they can create. Um, we call them channels. So we look at different channels. Council itself is a channel. The task force that we create, the public, other major stakeholders like industry and institutions like school. Um, and also look very closely at what we're asking folks when we engage them. Um, and, and there's some well understood practice around community engagement that has five stages. Um, and we're always make sure that we don't ask too much of our stakeholders and quite frankly, uh, don't ask too little. Um, and then there's a whole series of activities that actually um, foster that engagement. Um, communication is very important. So key messages coming from uh, uh, task forces and other groups, uh, as well as municipality itself, supported by that analysis, supported by the feedback from the community, and then ongoing evaluation and reporting of that engagement. These are all the fundamentals of community en engagement. So the practice of community engagement is not a new one when it comes to community energy planning, uh, but the two projects I'm talking about tonight have really embraced the practice of community engagement, structure of it, um, and embedded it into a so I want to just talk about what a task force looks like and make a high level point. So Oakville is the example I'm using here. Oakville was the lead um, as, as a local government um, in creating a task force. And then that task force got busy identifying the stakeholders. And so this is quite real. This is what the task force in Oakville looks like. Um, I can talk about each of those. If you look at them, they can all play a role in implementing the plan that's been delivered. to Public at large is always, always there, of course. Um, and are represented by communities um, and uh, just citizens themselves at the various meetings and other engagement take place. The point of this is not necessarily uh, to describe a task force. I think you might recognize its intention easily, but to say that the municipality is only one stakeholder at that table. This is where we really get to community. This is the community. It still plays a very strong role uh, in, in making this happen but they are only one stakeholder at the table. Really a visual representation of what community energy plan, emphasis on community. 
So what do we mean by local government and what is their role? As I just said, here's a bit of a, a list. Um, I could go through all of them. Municipalities have taken the lead in doing community energy planning without any exception that I can think of, certainly in Ontario. So they can convene, they can bring stakeholders together as I've just shown you. Um, their planners, and this is, this is potentially should be at the top of the list, is that you know, municipalities plan the future of the municipality um, and can really set a course towards um, uh, lower, lower climate, uh, sorry, lower, lower GHG footprint as we see in the official planning and secondary planning activity, at least initial efforts to do it, we're seeing that in all municipalities, it's not an easy thing to do because you interface with the market. In the case of development, home builders, you know, job locators, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and of course, there's, there's policy frameworks set by the provincial government that set the limit of municipalities' ability to Bridge and activities in part of growth uh, versus comply, uh, setting expectations. That kind of thing. Um, economic development is what I wanted to talk about. If I have a few more minutes left, they can communicate, of course, and educate the municipality. They can be a shareholder, and they already are in terms of the status quo in, in Guelph and any other. In mostly, every city uh, owns all or part of their local um, electrical utility. Um, they can be investors, as they often are in their electrical utilities, or businesses related. Um, and of course, municipalities can collectively advocate to other levels of government for continued policy framework and other support. So I wanted to talk a little bit about economic development, um, and what happens. Some municipalities um, create entities that are um, not, not within the municipality, arm's length um, community-based organization. The municipal Act allows for service corporations to typically set up as holding companies. Most municipalities uh, have holding companies um, and, and their utilities are generally housed in uh, holding companies. That creates a framework for the development of strategic partnerships to implement community energy plans. Um, and gets away from the sometimes constricting, but still important procurement process that municipalities engage in, in terms of competitive bidding, um, which can really make it difficult to implement strategic or integrated activities. Um, and many municipalities are beginning to look at uh, service corporations under the municipal law. However, it's not the only thing that works. Some municipalities have economic development, uh, uh, organizations in the community, of course, chambers of commerce exist uh, as, as a long tradition that can um, be part of interfacing with um, the marketplace and actors in the marketplace that can help implement activities defined in a community energy plan. And, uh, and I'll name our Energy Guelph. Obviously, it was set in motion by council. Uh, it's continued to be municipally supported and has the objective of implementing uh, Guelph's community energy plan as was updated recently. No different in Oakville, where they've really embraced this, uh, learning from others, um, exploring it further. Uh, the concept has matured uh, since uh, Guelph did its plan significantly. Oakville's created an implementation management office, which is arm's length from the community and really doesn't have any official ties to council. Brampton is creating a center for community energy transformation, and it may well be more connected to the municipality uh, as a committee of council or something similar. Their intentions are both the same, which is to implement the plan, understanding that it's much more than the local government and the municipality it needs to be. Um, strategic partnerships in the community with stakeholders to help implement these plans is paramount. Um, yeah, I'm having trouble. There we go. Um, Evan, how much time do I have? Can I ask you to give me a... Um, how about, uh, can you wrap it up in five, Rob? I see that we're starting to lose people here, unfortunately. I guess they're moving okay. on. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. I'm just going to race through these last slides then. Um, apologies if I'm taking longer. Uh, I rehearsed it at home and obviously it's always slower when you do it real person. I just want to talk about what we mean by energy transition. And I've just got some pictures here, so it should go easily. 
we talk about uh, community energy plans and sometimes they're perceived as complex and new and full of risk, uh, difficult and expensive, and lots of very burdensome perceptions. Um, very often, my experience and those colleagues I've worked with respond with, let's talk a little bit about what we mean by energy transition, put a little history to this concept. So here, here's a little bit of a picture um, log here to walk through you know the original the foundational energy supplies to communities look like this burning wood sawmills etc horses in the field that was how energy was acquired and utilized to build communities um, that started to aggregate around infrastructure um, so we have a great story here in southern Ontario of water uh, Niagara Falls water driven hydro serving southern Ontario Guelph was right in its path in one of the first communities um, and, and hydro started really uh, developing a powerful economic uh, driver um, role uh, in the province, especially in the southern region of the province. Bottom picture is from Guelph. Those of you who know our history a little bit will know that that's a coal gas plant that sits uh, where the uh, parking lot across from the police station is uh, that created coal gas um, that was used to light uh, street lamps. So here's another economic connection is that Street lamps in downtown changed the entire profile of uh, shopping hours um, and had a very profound positive effect on uh, shopping in other downtown because of energy source. Um, and then we really talk about the growth of that as it starts to impact on economy and culture. And this is to me one of the most interesting things about looking at history of energy. Is that we look how energy was perceived over time. Um, and some of you will remember some of this. Oh, we go back long enough where electricity was one time perceived as the, a miracle source of energy and it was boundless in its supply and cheap in its cost um, and you know we saw the, the, the uh, creation of large mills um, around that driver we started to look at the impact in home um, and lifestyles that folks could enjoy um, as a result of this technology that was delivering electricity um, and there's the cultural overlay. If we zoom ahead a uh, significant amount of time, 60, 70, 80 years, we see the kind of highly, highly centralized infrastructure um, that we know today um, and, uh, and its distance from communities, its centralization, its long transmission structures, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and they have served us well. And this is where we point out, and I'm not here to criticize that as necessarily uh, should not have happened, um, but there's some realities behind what you're looking at here that really speak to the value of transition energy, technology transition of energy. So this comes from Oakville, and this uh, is a Sankey diagram, something we've been using for communications a little more in the recent years. Um, I could walk you through it in detail. Basically, anything that's not color, gray, uh, dark gray, light gray, is waste energy. So although uh, these centralized systems I've showed you do a great job of producing and delivering energy reliably, no question, um, they have a great deal of built-in uh, in terms of uh, end use. So, you know, the extreme example is making a cup of coffee from energy produced by a nuclear plant. Those happen the electron. You can actually, uh, through intuition, you can see the energy. So, another point around that is around economy. This comes from uh, Guelph Hydro's 2015 annual report. And it might be a little small to read, but basically it says about 80% of the dollars you spend on your hydro bill that we all spend as citizens of Guelph leaves the community to. Um, to pay for and maintain that infrastructure I showed you earlier. That's just the reality. So if we look at lo local economies and current energy delivery systems, we make that connection by following the money. Um, and those dollars leave the community. So a fundamental objective around keeping those dollars local can have a profound impact. And this takes us to what we mean technology-wise around the transitioning energy. Um, and I've listed some of those in my Brampton example. Energy efficiency, different vehicles, local generation, renewables, um, distributed uh, heat uh, uh, systems, etc., are all by definition local. 
And the providers of those products and services, big companies that you would recognize, um, are all understanding this transition. They're aware that every community is going to be. They're aware that the market is changing from that centralized concept to local. And they are looking for ways to uh, access those changing markets. And to give you an idea, uh, and maybe I could think about wrapping up here um, uh, on this slide. Um, it's often thought of as um, a boutique idea, you know, becoming green, smart energy communities, or a, a, an environmentally driven, very expensive concept. Um, that has changed so radically that uh, this, often this slide is the first one I show. What are the markets? Um, there's endless information out there around this. Anybody who follows the markets as an investor or just a general interest would be aware of this. Um, billions of dollars in the size of the markets growing in the area of distributed energy generation. Uh, energy efficiency itself, you know, by energy efficiency market reports, people that do market reports are looking at the size of the potential. You can see it's in three digit billions. Um, and you know, and there are companies pursuing that market. Many, many companies. Um, and I could go on. Even the District Energy, which has actually had a very small uptake in North America relative to Europe, um, is going to be. You know, it's at the sort of quarter trillion dollar level by 2024. Companies are aware of this in great detail and are pursuing it. And, and I'll just close verbally, Evan, um, by saying. This is the point I wanted to start out making is that uh, municipalities sort of look at in implementing community energy plans as burdensome. Um, and sometimes wondering why they're pursuing it in the whole of a global effort, even though they may be contributing to a global climate change. The local benefit, the local value is is an imperative. It's it's almost as if this market is growing and happening. Um, it's not a coincidence that I'm making this connection. This, this activity is where jobs are being created. Jobs in the, in the in the traditional energy sector are declining. Jobs in this sector are growing rapidly. Um, and any community that wants to keep people working um, and the economy healthy um, would pay attention to that. Um, Increasingly, the cities I work with are understanding that. I know it was a key message when our Energy Guelph was at council last um, around not just the cost of implementing a community energy plan, but the economic opportunity. It's really a different way to label what is sometimes perceived as burdensome cost. So with that, Evan, I'll I have more slides, unfortunately, but with that in mind, I'll uh, I'll wrap up and thank everyone for their time. And thank you again, Emerge, for inviting me here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Rob. That's, uh, that was incredibly insightful. Um, I'm just going to ask you to just um, stop stop sharing your screen there. Yeah. And, um, and we are we open go. to questions. And can I ask you a hard one? <laughs> Right, right away, I, it was all really insightful and it's exciting to see the stuff that's happening with a lot of the other communities that, that, that you're working with around, around the province. Um, but I think there are probably a number of people on this, uh, on this uh, um, Zoom call this evening. Oh, and actually, sorry, before I ask the question, uh, I, I, I should say I meant to do a call out to two people that, uh, uh, two specific people that are, that are on the Zoom tonight. One is Karen Farbridge, who will be here next week. Thank you, Karen, for joining us this evening. And the other one is Lloyd Longfield, our, our MP, that, uh, that uh, we're very happy that, that he could be here as well. Um, but here, here's the question, Rob. I, I think a lot of people on this Zoom call are really concerned that we can't do this fast enough. Mm. And uh, uh, um, it's all very complicated. We're all, everybody is working as hard as we possibly can on it. Mm. And uh, maybe it's too big of a question, but I want to throw that one out, out to you and, and also encourage others to, to throw questions up on the chat when I, when I sort of okay. lob this one at you. Yeah. Yeah. Um. It, it is it is too big a question, but I, I won't dodge it. I, you know, um, I would say personally, you know, I'm mainly a practitioner, so um, 
uh, I'm, not, I'm not pushing back against your point, um, but it does take time to build those institutions, policy frameworks, and partnerships. Um, but I, you know, I, I am aware of the urgency. There's always another category that I believe is a, a very a practical and honest thing that needs to be talked about. Is is, um, is the adaptation concept? Mm -hmm. Is that we will experience? Well, we are experiencing. I mean, just have to watch the news today. But the very real impact of climate are already happening. Um, so I kind of look at it as adaptation needs to be seen as a very important strategy so that um, we're, we're accommodating the rush to mitigate them. And I know that's probably an unsatisfactory answer, but it's ultimately the burden <laughs> that everyone carries who's in this line of work. Um, the thing that I observe, though, is a conversation that I sometimes despair uh, I see happen, which is, um, you know, paraphrasing one side, one voice, collective voice, which is, um, for God's sake, do something, you know, so elected leaders hear that message, other, other um, leaders in the community and other sectors hear that all the time, for God's sake, do something, uh, and that's valid. Um, Sometimes, the other side of the equation I despair on is loads, and I sometimes get caught up in this myself, is that it takes a lot to get to, towards implementing towards such ambitious objectives. It's often perceived as not acknowledging that urgency. You've got to carry both thoughts in your head moving forward um, and as fast as you can. Uh, um, Rob, I'm going to paraphrase a bit of a question that just came up there as well. Um, uh, what, are the, what other community out there is being really aggressive on the part of um, district energy? And, and what could we have done differently? Ah. So there's two parts to that question. Yeah. Okay. Well, it depends on where you set the bar for aggressive. So I'll set it myself. Um, no community uh, that I'm aware of, and I'm qualified, I, I'm not the knower of all things, but um, no community has, uh, other than Guelph, when it, when it did, at the time it did, uh, aspired to create a, a utility. Looked at the entire community as a framework to move towards the creation of full thermal services to the community that we see in Europe, Europe being the kind of um, for that. Um, I'll say that. So Guelph, you know, Guelph enjoys a uh, leadership role there in terms of what it or to do. What I what I am seeing is um, lots of neighborhood level um, efforts to develop district energy distribution, and that's fair game. They all start somewhere. Um, you know, all you all thermal utilities started as small neighborhood, sometimes. Um, and they exist already. Great London, Windsor has them, Toronto has them. And even Guelph has them on. Um, so uh, growing those nodes um, can often be a great strategy to think more holistically and aspire to serve an entire community. And think of our existing utility. I mean, Guelph Hydro and now Electra is over 100 years old. Started in a similar way. And I showed you a slide, actually, of all those utilities. Thanks for that. And I, 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 I missed you there for a second, but um, I think you were mentioning is the University of Guelph has a district energy system for all of their buildings. Yes. And that system's been there for, what, 40 years, maybe 50 years? Uh, I'd be guessing, but yes. In that very long, a long time. So, so the concept is, 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 is a, the technology is fairly mature, let's put it that way, and in areas that are dense enough, it works well. Well, it's not only mature, but it's very simple at the outset. Making and distributing heat in pipes is not complex. No. Um, I've got another question here. Thank you, Lloyd, for this question. Um, and uh, Rob, uh, he asks, um, are municipalities using some common measures to track progress? Uh, reporting into national goals seem to be an opportunity given the progress of local efforts. 
That's a really good question. I think generally, no. There's lots of organizations that are attempting to find reporting structures that uh, create a, a credible com comparison um, or common metrics for municipalities to compare themselves to each other. Um, there are, um, um, there's reporting mechanisms for corporate social responsibility. So this is not exactly what the question was. At the community level, it's very difficult, but there are groups working on that. Um, uh, for example, um, there's a protocol, protocol meaning a methodology for determining your baseline of energy use, greenhouse gas emissions, yeah, and ICWI, actually, two organizations I've referred to tonight that actually have created that. And it's pretty, it's pretty standard. So they run a program called Partners for Climate Protection where they actually gather reporting. Um, about 200 municipalities participate so that they can submit their greenhouse gas emissions uh, for comparison. Um, more legislative side, the policy framework side is that municipalities under the Green Energy Act, which has been dismantled by our current government. However, what survived? That's, um, that's provincial, just for clarification. Yeah, sorry, I'm switching to provincial, provincial. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, Lloyd, we moved to provincial. Thank you. Switching to provincial now. Um, yeah, they, um, uh, municipalities as corporate entities are now reporting quite rigorously on their energy use well as they're planning it. There's quite a good body of work there, but that's for the municipalities operations. Uh, and, and last question that, uh, that uh, oh, wait a second, we've got another one here. Um, oh, uh, Karen's answered this one. Lloyd, uh, Quest is developing a smart energy community benchmark to measure the progress of municipalities in their energy transition. Thank you, Karen, for answering that. Yes. And actually, the, the last question that I had for you tonight, Rob, was uh, if, if Karen's name there. Um, actually, I, I had this in my head before I saw her name there. What's the hard question we should ask Karen yeah. next week? <laughs> That's a setup question. Um, it is completely. Okay, well, uh, I'll, I'll take a shot at that. I'll take a go shot for at it. that. Um, I think, well, I think Karen's going to talk about best practice in Canada. Um, so, you know, I'll steal a bit from your question is, you know, if you had to pick a municipality in Canada, uh, which one is leading on the many fronts related to implementing community energy? Um, and uh, Karen might have a sense of that. I kind of partially know the answer is that you know, always try and be optimistic. And there is progress, absolutely. I've talked about the movement of municipalities. It's true and plenty of evidence. Um, but that pivot from planning to implementation uh, and holistic implementation of plans, not pilot projects, um, it's harder evidence to find. So when you go to the PCP and look at uh, emissions submissions, you don't see municipalities budging their emissions profile. You really don't. So we're at the precipice of, a, of a, an age of implementation. It's very optimistic. The market is certainly signaling their belief that it's going to happen. Um, but uh, I don't see a lot of holistic movement. Karen might have some more to say about it. Gotcha. And, and she's re rephrased my question. And what she wrote was, what is the meaning of life? And uh, I would rephrase hers and say, what's the meaning of life, the universe and everything? And Karen, the answer is 47? Or is it 42? Now I forgot. The <laughs> On that note, Rob, a, a, a great big thank you to you. I, I really appreciated uh, your, your sharing your expertise with us tonight. Uh, there are an awful lot of people stayed right through to the end. And uh, I really appreciate all uh, all that you've shared with us. And uh, now we're set up for the big hard question to give Karen, but we've given her a heads up. So, right. so thanks for that. So, so it better be a good, no pressure, Karen, but it better be a good answer. Thank thanks. you. Thank you, Evan and your colleagues at Emerge. Um, I'd be more than happy to come back anytime. Great. Thanks a lot. And thanks to everyone for joining us this, us this evening. Good evening. Thanks. Bye-bye.